morning. You're very welcome to the online fellowship of Valley Kale Presbyterian Church for Palm Sunday 2020. As you know, we're not in uh, the church. We're all scattered in our own homes, but I'm here uh, this morning uh, helping you to reflect on the glory of the gospel uh, as we understand it from scripture. And we're going to be joined today in fellowship uh, with a man called the Reverend Dr. Scotty Smith, who has recorded a special message for us. And he'll be sharing that uh, later on in our time of fellowship. So uh, stay tuned uh, for that. Just some announcements. We're going into what people call Easter week. Uh, it's going to be a very strange Easter, isn't it? Apart from each other. Uh, but nonetheless, what I propose to do is uh, each morning at seven o'clock in the morning and uh, later on in the evening, maybe eight o'clock at night, I am going to read a devotional reflection from this book. I read this book every Easter to remind me of the death of Jesus Christ on the cross and what it means. It's a book called The Cross He Bore by Frederick Leahy. It's published by Banner of Truth Trust. And I'm going to read two chapters a day from that book as we go through Monday through to Good Friday. And then, of course, Easter Sunday, next Sunday. And we'll have a special family service. Obviously, again, you'll all be in your own homes, uh, but the McNeely family will be sharing readings and I'll bring a message as we celebrate together, even um, though it's slightly artificial online, but we'll be together in spirit as the Lord blesses us. Let me remind anyone uh, who needs help that we have links to practical help. If people need it, just send me a message and I can pass the message along to different people who can uh, offer help. And also, I just want to thank people out there for phoning one another. I've been on the phone to quite a few people through the week and I've discovered that quite a few members of the congregation and the wider community are phoning each other. And I think that's really important. And if you haven't picked up the phone to phone somebody else, I think that will be really helpful uh, just in the next number of weeks because it's become really obvious to me now that we're kind of into the third week of this, that loneliness and isolation is a real problem for some people. So I want to encourage you to continue on uh, phoning one another. On this Facebook page, I want you to check out the guide to family worship by my friend Jimmy Mantis, uh, another American. Jimmy is from Fairview Methodist in Tennessee, and Jimmy has done a really simple, good guide to starting and keeping up family worship. And I kind of have three passions for Bally Keel uh, Presbyterian in this period. The first is that families worship together uh, every day if they can. The second is that individuals, uh, maybe people living on their own, uh, or whatever their circumstances, really enjoy a daily ritual of prayer and of Bible reading. Uh, I've been trying to keep to a, a daily ritual myself, just getting up early and seeking God's face and reading scripture and praying. And it's done me uh, a lot of uh, good. It's, it's brought real encouragement into my life. So I want families to worship together. I want individuals to worship together. And also, thirdly, I want us all to have a deep longing for fellowship and worship together and of coming back together. So that's the three things I really want to see happen in this unusual season. It's a good time to memorize scripture. Romans 12, 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 12 is our call to fellowship. Memorize this verse. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Maybe you can say that after me. Romans 12, 12. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Let's join together now in prayer. We pray, O oh God, this Palm Sunday, we pray together that we would overflow as a community of Christians with hope and with patience in the middle of this tribulation. And we pray, Lord God, that we wouldn't just hope for our being together again as glorious as that will be, but that we will have hope for the new heaven and the new earth that you promise in scripture. Help us to remember that the risen Christ is the very heart of our hope. We pray that we would have a deep yearning for his word and his presence through his Holy Spirit as he ministers to us now. And as we pray and as we come into your presence as a church family online, we want to confess our sins. We want to confess, Lord God, those times in which we have displayed a lack of faith. 
We want to confess those times, Lord God, in which we've been scared or angry with one another in our own homes. We want to confess, Lord, I want to confess times of selfishness or being cynical. God, remind us that on the cross, Jesus Christ shed blood for our sin. Remind us, Lord, of the body risen and the Holy Spirit given that we, by faith, would experience grace. Remind us of the grand scale of the gospel, that from Genesis right through to Revelation, there is a story of your redemption which includes us, dead and dying in Adam, risen and rising in Christ. So give us an ardor and a passion for this good news. Secure us in your promise, Lord, your promise never to leave us or forsake us. And do so always, powerfully, royally, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, my friend Scotty is going to re read uh, and, and share later on from Zechariah uh, chapter 9. But I just want to put that into context as we look at Luke chapter 19. If you've got a Bible there, look at Luke chapter 19 uh, and the Palm Sunday reading uh, from verse 28. When Jesus had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And when he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount that's called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat, untied and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away and found it just as they had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they'd seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And when he drew near, and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they're hidden from your eyes. Amen. Join with me in prayer again, please, as we pray for other people. Well, Heavenly Father, um, again we want to pray for others. God, we want to pray for our countries, for the nations, Lord, for your peace in the nations. We want to pray, Lord God, for wisdom in high places. We really pray, Lord God, for um, testing to be rolled out uh, with respect to this coronavirus. And indeed, pray for people who are researching into a vaccine to, um, to cure us of this virus. Uh, we pray, Lord God, for people who are sick at the minute. And we want to pray for health workers. We want to value them and thank you for them. And thank you for people in the community who have responded to uh, work with them and help them and support them. We particularly want to pray for um, people in our own congregation who work in the health system. I want to pray for Carmen Barr, who's um, not been that well. And we pray that Carmen is restored and is able to go back to serve, along with other members of our congregation who serve in the hospitals and in the GP surgeries. We want to pray for her husband Gregory as well, that he can get back to work distributing food to needy people. We pray for a man called Niall, who has been seriously ill uh, in the Matter Hospital in Belfast, and we want to pray that he would know healing and strength. Being asked to pray for him by friends, and we just pray for him. We also want to pray for the lonely, and people not able to access the Facebook ministry. I want to pray for Rob and the elders and the members of our pastoral care committees. They phone people up and where necessary, deliver messages. 
We pray that they bring blessing and encouragement. And their blessing and encouragement be on the whole community as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for praying with me. And I continue to pray, please, uh, for God's blessing upon this congregation and upon our town and community at this time. Now, boys and girls, oh my goodness. I actually went out for a bike ride the other day and I bumped into one of our number. And you'll know this young man very well because I spoke about him last week. And he said to me, Martin, Martin, I'm not sad anymore because we've got sweets in our house. And I thought, thank goodness. But I don't want you to forget that I will have special sweets for you when you get back to the church. Now, and you can guess who that young man was. Now, I also want to be, um, I also want to give a big shout out to Ralph and Adam Gage. All right, men? Hope you're good to your little sister and your mum and dad. And the reason why I want to give a big shout out to them is because when I was telling the story of Samson last week, they got into Power Ranger strike pose. And I wish I could have seen that. So maybe you can either send me a picture or whenever we gather back, which hopefully will not be too long, you can show me. And I've no doubt I would be scared if I saw you strike this pose. So big shout out to you guys. All the other boys and girls, uh, whoever looks after you, if they want to send me a message so I can give you a shout out, I'll, I'll try and do that. And it's also, I was thinking of uh, young Andrew the other day. I wonder if Andrew has seen any lambs yet in the countryside. I've seen lots of lambs out in the Braid Valley. It's very, very pretty. So I wonder if Andrew has seen any lambs himself. And all the other boys and girls, I hope they're well. Now, let's read our story for this week, which is all about the faith of a foreign woman. Her name is Ruth. So over time, a great famine came to the land of Israel. And Naomi and her husband and their two sons moved to the land of Moab. And there the boys grew up and married two women from that foreign land. Everyone was happy. But years passed and Naomi's husband and sons died. Now the women were alone and Naomi told her sons' wives she was going to return to Bethlehem. There you go, look. Sadness turned to joy. Ruth ran down the road after Naomi. Wait, Ruth called. Wait for me. Naomi stopped and turned to see her daughter-in-law racing to catch up with her. The older woman put down her belongings and shook her head. No, Ruth, you must stay here. Moab is your home. Your parents live here. It would be best for you to be with them. But I'll be sad if you leave without me. Wherever you go, I'll go too. There on the road, Ruth made her choice. She and Naomi had been brought through so much together. It was time to start a new life. You are truly a daughter to me, said Naomi. We will go together. When the two women arrived in Bethlehem, all the townspeople welcomed them. They remembered Naomi. They were happy to have her back in their neighborhood. When they learned about Ruth's kindness to Naomi, the people were pleased to be her friend too. Look at this. Ruth and Naomi made a home in Bethlehem. Even though they were very poor, they thanked God for providing for them. Each day, Ruth tried to find food for herself and Naomi. Her mother-in-law suggested she go into the fields owned by a rich man named Boaz. He's my relative. He'll take care of us. Every day, Ruth went to the fields of Boaz. And as the harvesters finished cutting the stalks of grain, Ruth followed them, together, uh, to, followed them to gather what was left behind. One day, Boaz noticed Ruth. Boaz was a generous man. He told his workers to let Ruth gather as much grain as she wanted. He shared his lunch with her and sent home extra food for Naomi. Soon Boaz and Ruth fell in love. Naomi was grateful to God that Ruth had found a good man to marry. After a while, Ruth and Boaz had a baby boy named Obed. Ruth and Naomi's sadness had turned to joy. And what's God's message in this story? Well, as God's message is, I've chosen you for a journey. Trust in my plan. You'll have a son whose, father will, whose son will father the great King David. The line of kings will rule Israel for hundreds of years. And from them, the king of kings will come and rule forevermore. So it's through Ruth 
and Boaz, a son will come, and then a grandson who's going to be the great King David, and then many, 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 many grandchildren after that. We're going to have another king, and that king is the one who on Palm Sunday, we remember, rides his donkey into Jerusalem, not just to save the people of Israel, but to bring peace to the nations, and that includes us. It's amazing how one part of that story was located many, many years ago in a very difficult, stricken land without any hope. But that's where God really begins to work. When we think there's no hope, God brings hope because he promises to be our God and we to be his people. Let me pray. Father, I thank you that on Palm Sunday we can know the hope that King Jesus brings into people's lives. And we thank you that all through history, through people like Ruth and Boaz, you worked to secure that hope for us. We pray, Lord God, that all the boys and girls are blessed and that they treasure the fact that you always love us. You always work to bless us and to bring us peace. So may we be blessed always in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks very much, boys and girls, for listening to me. I can't wait to share with you next Easter Sunday as well. And uh, I'll be saving up some special sweets for you. As I said last week, I will not forget. Now, for everybody else, um, let me introduce my friend, Scotty Smith. I uh, first met Scotty a number of years ago when I studied in Orlando uh, as part of my Doctor of Ministry project. I had a whole week studying some uh, wonderful truths from the book of Jonah. Uh, with uh, Scott. I never forgot that and got to know him then. And then he came across to do the Keswick and Port Stewart Convention a number of summers ago. And some of you will have heard Scott at that. Other people will have Scotty's book, Everyday Prayers, and uh, will have benefited from that and his other uh, prayer books as well. And his other uh, books, he's published a number of books, all worth reading. Scotty um, looked after me in his house last year when I was over in uh, Tennessee and his wife, Darlene, I love them very much. And he's also connected with the Surge Mission Organization, who I've partnered with and work very closely with. I'm so grateful for Scotty taking the time. And uh, I've met very few people who've got such a passion and a hunger for Christ. And I know you're going to be blessed as Scotty shares with us now the great message of the King, the promised King who brings peace to the nations from Zechariah chapter 9. God bless you. Good morning, brothers and sisters in Ballykill, Northern Ireland. Scotty Smith here, along with my wife, Darlene, and our home in Franklin, Tennessee. And we had hoped to be with you, actually, the first Sunday. I think it was the first or the second Sunday in May. But we know we have a shared providence called pandemic coronavirus. It doesn't limit, however, in any way, the good news of the gospel reaching across the ocean deep into our hearts. And I find it really quite comforting to know that we celebrate today, Palm Sunday, and this upcoming Holy Week leading up to our Easter celebration, right in the middle of this world crisis. Because Jesus has come into a world in crisis, of a far greater crisis than simply a very stubborn virus that is impacting, really, cultures, communities, economies around the world. And it's for such a people and into such a time that Jesus does come. Now, the scripture we're going to use this year for our Palm Sunday celebration comes from the prophet Zechariah. If you have a Bible, if you have uh, something electronic that would put your eyes on the text of the Word of God, I invite you to turn to Zechariah chapter 9. I will begin reading at verse 9. And these words immediately will be very familiar. Uh, this is the story that is taken up in the gospel record of our Lord and Savior Jesus as he comes now, nearly at the end of 33 years of incarnate life. He comes now into Jerusalem. And the prophet Zechariah just outlines exactly what he, the Messiah, Jesus, will be about and how this should, on this particular Palm Sunday, 
connect us with a deep, deep, deep hope. In fact, I'm titling this word today, living as prisoners of hope. There are all kinds of imprisonments, but we're going to see in the scripture, our heavenly father through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is calling us to live as prisoners of hope. Just before I read the scripture, let me remind you, let me remind all of us, those in Valley Kill and perhaps many other places in the world that might tune in at some time to this sharing of the word of God and the gospel of God's grace. Zechariah was a prophet of restoration. He began his ministry about 20 years after the Babylonian captivity. You will remember with me that God loves his people so much that he will create difficult circumstances over which we have no control in order to restore us to gospel sanity, to bring us back to first love, to bring us back to understanding that we are so foolish when we try to make our lives work apart from the God who made us and the God who so generously redeems us through the work of his son, Jesus. Zechariah prophesies about 20 years now that the people of God have moved out of the Babylonian captivity back into Jerusalem. The temple has been rebuilt for the most part, beginning with the altar, because God's people always know our God through his initiation and through his um, gift of sacrifice. Um, we know in the first beginnings of the tabernacle that would become the temple, the centerpiece of the worship of God's people is sacrifice. Our God uh, does not exaggerate when he says he takes sin very seriously. So uh, various animals, various stipulations of sacrifice would be offered so that God's people would know our God to be a God of mercy and grace. Well, we know where eventually all sacrifices point, which we will be reminded of this morning. Zechariah writes to the people of God. He calls them to a fresh repentance. He calls them to a living hope. They don't understand why revival has not broken out yet. And so Zechariah, through a series of visions, through a series of promises, through a series of proddings, leads up to the very words that I will read now. Zechariah chapter nine, verse nine. Now just listen to this incredible word of encouragement at a time when God's people are so afraid, so tired, so weary, and many of them so angry. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Told you you would remember this text. Let's go on. Verse 10, our God says, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He, meaning the Messiah, the one who will come, he will proclaim peace to the nations. Nations, plural, not just one nation. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will free your prisoners from the waterless pit. Return to your fortress, O oh, prisoners of hope. Let me read that again. Return to your fortress, O oh, prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. Now let me pray for the preaching of the gospel, that our hearts might really receive great, true, living hope in a season and an hour in which we are desperate for it. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, thank you for the family of God. Thank you for Marty, my dear, precious friend, whom Darlene and I love so much, he and Julie, the family. Thank you, Lord, for Balakil. And uh, Lord, this family of believers, Lord, that we so look forward to visiting in these coming months, Lord willing. We pray now on this Palm Sunday that you would bring good news of great joy to us. Lord, it's a time in our world very much like it was in Zechariah's day. There's discouragement, 
There is hopelessness. There is powerlessness. There are real questions of how long, O Lord? So Lord, thank you that your word is always true. It's always beautiful and it is always timely. Lord, protect these whom you cherish from anything I would preach or teach that does not find its clear anchor, authority, and truth in the word of God. But Lord, where we will be faithful to bring your word today in keeping with your glory, consistent with the riches of the gospel, then Lord, wing these things deep into our heart, we pray in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Amen. Well, again, we're hold on to that language, living as prisoners of hope. And let's walk through this text. Let me tell you the points that we're going to cover as we uh, spend our time in the worship of God this morning and, and maybe even revisiting the sermon later when you have more time. But here are here's what we're going to see. Four major affirmations through this incredible portion of the Word of God. We're going to look at the promise of hope. We will consider the prince of hope. We will look at the particulars of hope. And lastly, the price of hope. So let's walk through the scripture together, verse by verse, starting with the promise of hope. Verse nine, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, daughter of Jerusalem. Now that may seem startling to you today. And to me, it would have been startling to the people of God in Zechariah's day. It's almost like someone coming up with a brescia up with a bucket of spring water, throwing it into our face, waking us up from the doldrums, uh, bringing something of shocking proportion at a time when our emotions seem to be contradicting any notion of hope. Well, you see, the, the promise of hope is in the God of promise. We need to remind ourselves all the time that God's promises claim us. We don't claim them. Our God is not passively sitting in heaven, waiting for us to muster the energy to claim his promises. No, when we are strong, when we are weak, when we are sleepy, when we are alert in every season of our lives, the promises of God claim us. And this is why God speaks with such language. He's speaking joy. He's speaking energy. He's speaking He's calling his people to respond in a fashion precisely because he can be trusted. He is the God who is filled with joy. In his courts, there is joy forevermore. He is the fountain of what we need all the time, every day, pandemic or no pandemic. So the promise of hope is rooted in who God is himself. The fulfillment of all hope, as we'll see in this text, is to remember that every single promise, as the Apostle Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, every single promise God has made finds its yes in Jesus. Jesus Christ, God the Messiah, God in flesh, is the emphatic yes to every single promise God has made. All kinds of promises, promises that came through the prophet Zechariah, promises rooted in the earliest recording of the word of God in the book of Genesis, when God declared himself that he would be a great and gracious redeemer, that through the very couple that rebelled and brought into this uh, God's world, sin and death, he would use that family ultimately as the family through which the promise of the redeemer would be realized. I find that so encouraging to know that none of us is ever beyond the reach of God's grace, just as our first parents. And none of us is beyond the need of God's grace. Jesus is given to us that his love might be extended through us. That's just what God's people needed to remember in the days Zechariah held forth his prophecy. So the promise of hope is one that stirs within us an imagination. Can I risk hoping? What, what indeed is the basis of this hope? Well, it is God the promise keeper, the only promise keeper really in the entire Bible. Well, this moves us to the Prince of Hope. Early in our text, we see that God roots every promise 
Uh, and every provision for everything he's called us to be about, he's rooted these things not in our response, but in his generosity. Listen to verse nine. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, why? Well, second part of verse nine, see, and I love that. We'll come back to that. See, look, behold, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Isn't that magnificent this morning, this Palm Sunday, in the midst of a world that is truly broken, truly needy, truly alone? Think of quarantine and isolation and, and, and such an image of being cut off in, in, into such an environment the Lord says to us, look, you don't run to your king, your king's coming to you. See, he's coming to you. And Jesus comes, as we know in the fulfillment of these words, he comes into Jerusalem on this very donkey, this foal of a donkey, so small, so unimpressive. Jesus came into Jerusalem on a mission. Jesus knew as a member of the triune Godhead, the plan laid before the world began that would require what he alone could give and did give fully for us, his very life. Promise of hope rooted in God, the promise maker, promise keeper. The Prince of hope, the Lord Jesus himself. Indeed, Jesus is God on the back of a young donkey. May we never lose our wonder at such sacrifice, gentleness, weakness and majesty. Just phenomenal to think of the humility of Jesus, which we should at the beginning of this Easter week. Is it not to our undoing to see that here's how low our God stoops. Jesus is born in a stable. He comes into the city that bears his name, a city of peace. He alone can give peace. He comes not riding in on a big white horse. He comes so humbly, so lowly. Number three, what are the particulars of this hope? Indeed, we're, we're, we're called as we begin this Easter week together to, to be startled with the enormity of God's hope. What are the particulars of this hope? Verse 10, once again, our God speaking in the first person. I, through the work of this one that comes on this donkey into the city, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem. The battle bow will be broken. He, the Messiah, will proclaim peace, shalom, the, the, the righting of wrong, the setting free of all kinds of captives, the breaking of all kinds of imprisonments. He, the Messiah, will proclaim peace to the nations, plural, not just Jerusalem. His rule, listen to this and be encouraged this Lord's Day morning in Northern Ireland as I am here in Franklin, Tennessee. His rule, the Messiah's rule, will extend from sea to sea, from the river to the ends of the earth. It's just enormous to consider the particulars of this hope. He, the Messiah, will proclaim peace. I, I used the word shalom a moment ago. Really, shalom is the Hebrew word which you will know for peace, and probably the best way to define shalom is to go back to the first two chapters of the Bible and ponder the Garden of Eden. Because shalom is a state of everything being the way it was meant to be. Everything aligned, everything good, true, and beautiful. Well, that was forfeited, that was lost, that was broken. But God, who is rich in mercy, set in motion this glorious plan to bring shalom to the broken, to rebels, fools, and idolaters, just like me, just like you, just like friends that would join us in this good technology of Wi-Fi recorded message. We're, we're, we're all kind of vulnerable right now, are we not? We're in a position, a unique position to know that we're not in control. And it's to such a people that we need to hear this particular gifting, shaping provision of a peace that reaches into all of the brokenness, all the fears. As we sing 
during the season of Christmas. The hope, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in Jesus. The night he's born and now the day he comes into Jerusalem at the beginning of what we call Holy Week. Truly, Jesus did not enter Jerusalem to be celebrated, but to be crucified. He entered the city to defeat evil and reverse the effects of the fall, to end all wars. I love that language of how battle bows will be broken. Every image of warfare, of hatred, of malice, of nation against nation, tribe against tribe. Jesus, the Messiah, takes on the reversal of the effects of the fall. And indeed, Jesus gives us peace that cannot be found anywhere else. And let me ask you during this season, where have you been looking for peace? Just for some promise that the coronavirus would be over by what, midsummer? Are we anchoring our longing for peace and hope simply in something that will medicate our pain? Have you found it easier to act out in ways that really only temporarily at best give some degree of relief? Where the good news of the gospel is that into the core of our hearts, into the very heartbeat of this universe, God sends his son, Jesus. He comes to make his blessings flow for as the curse is found. Well, we're considering the promise of hope. We are considering the Prince of Hope, which we will yet consider more. The particulars of hope, oh, they are enormous. Don't you love this part of our text? His rule will extend from sea to sea and from river to the ends of the earth. A world of justice, goodness, and beauty is coming. I thought recently about the word pandemic, and you know that um, the word pan uh, basically uh, refers to the fullness or everywhere. So a an uh, epidemic is something more local. A pandemic is it's everywhere. Well, what we need to know, my dear brothers and sisters, as we are living in a pandemic of coronavirus, the larger the larger pan story is the fact that our God has promised one day to fill the entire earth with his glory. Martin Luther once said that the devil is real, real and he is fierce, but he is God's devil. Meaning what? There's only one who has ultimate authority and it is God himself. We would say similarly right now, this pandemic is real, but God is ultimate. God is sovereign. This is God's pandemic, meaning this. He is sovereign over this entire unfolding story. The Lord has promised throughout his word that, that he will allow the natural effects of the fall or he will actually design seasons of disruption just to free us from the notion that in this world we can find a lasting city. Now the city for which we long is coming to us when this good king will come again, even the Lord Jesus. Well, this takes us therefore to the price of hope. How can we risk believing that the very world we live in right now that seems so fragile, so vulnerable, how can we possibly believe that one day in this world we will live to see that the Garden of Eden itself was just a preview of coming attractions, that this earth will be filled with the glory of God, that, that everything will be made new. Indeed, Jesus is not making all new things. He's making all things new. Or as Tolkien said, there's a day coming when everything sad will come untrue. Can, can we risk going there? Oh, my brothers and sisters in Northern Ireland, we do not need hype today. We need hope. We don't need spin. We need reality. Therefore, what is the price of this hope? Look with me at verse 11. Because of the blood of my covenant with you. See, that's, that's the basis for all of God's dealings. He's a covenantal God. A covenant is not a contract between equals. A covenant is the greater saying to the lesser, here is the deal. Here's the stipulation. And in the 
unfolding of God's great covenant of grace, he takes full responsibility to pay the price, the full price to fulfill every promise he has made. And this is what we mean by hope. Hope is the assurance that things will happen that God has promised. And we, more so than those in Zechariah's day, uh, ha have a clearer taste of this hope because we live on this side of the first coming of Jesus the Messiah, the one who did come into the city, the one who came precisely to die upon the cross for us and to be raised three days later. He came and he is coming again. This is what we mean by covenant. God has taken full responsibility to pay the complete price, the blood of the new covenant, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is the price and the assurance of the hope that we speak of today. And this is why we finish this reflection on this marvelous word, the end of this text. The end of verse 11, here's this grand affirmation, grand invitation. Return to your fortress, O prisoners of hope. I, once again, God is speaking, I will restore twice as much to you. Now let's just sit together for a few moments in this image of living as prisoners of hope. What are you in prison to? What have you found yourself, maybe most specifically through this pandi pandemic, what do your chains look like? Where, where do you find yourself running? Well, you know, there are a lot of imprisonments that we can live, but certainly right now, maybe the most functional category that is the opposite of hope is fear. And the most repeated command throughout the Bible is this one, do not fear, do not be afraid. But that is not God simply saying to us, in fact, it's not God saying to us at all that the emotion of fear is wrong. It's what we do in our fear. It's what we do with our fear to live in the fear of death, to live with the fear of missing out on things in life. How many of our routines have been changed radically? To live in the fear of not being enough or having enough. Do you not with me have some categories of fear that really make hoping seeming so, seem so impossible? Well, the good news is we are called to return to the fortress. What's the fortress? Well, the fortress is the gospel. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus is the only shelter. It's the home. It's the heartbeat of our God. This is why in the New Testament, this gospel, this work of Jesus is called unsearchable riches. It is the safe haven. It, it is the safe haven in this world. It is the ultimate ark that will get us home. It is all the peace that we need taking on all of our fears, fear of death, fear of man, fear of suffering, fear of outcomes we cannot control. Oh, can I just be vulnerable with you for a few moments? I turned 70 this year and um, I'm more aware of vulnerability. I'm more aware that most of my life is behind me rather than in front of me. And I, uh, I'm feeling very much not in control. And you know what? It's actually one of the best things that could happen to me or to you. We are not in control. It is good news to know that God says to us, he holds our hearts. He has his universe. He has begun a good work in you and me that he will bring to completion. It's not cliche to say we, we don't know what tomorrow holds, but we do know holds, who holds tomorrow. I am so thankful on this Palm Sunday with you to hear this incredible invitation to live as a prisoner of hope and to pray for you and to pray for me that this would be a week beginning today with Palm Sunday, leading all the way through the different um, rememberings of the story of Jesus up to Good Friday this coming week and Easter Sunday, just to, uh, just to allow our hearts in a season in which we don't have control, a season of quarantine and isolation to slow down, to marinate, to ponder, to behold the one who has come for us and is coming again for us. My brothers and sisters, you're not wrong 
to have fear, but always here in the Bible, the Lord say this to you and to me, do not be afraid, I. Do not be afraid, I am with you. Do not be afraid, I am the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. I just wanna take a few moments and pray for us now, saying to any of you who perhaps are just listening in or looking in on this service, whether you're in Northern Ireland or some other country or time zone in the world, let's not waste this pandemic. Let's not waste this season of numerous fears that give us the gift of vulnerability, that invite us to ponder who is our God now, to consider who is this man, Jesus. Oh, I pray you have heard today that because of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, you can have this full assurance, all of your sins are forgiven, not just the ones you're aware of, but the other 96% as well. To trust in this one who came gently into this city to be crucified, not celebrated, to see him climb upon the cross because no one could take his life from him, to see him break out of that stone-sealed tomb for our justification is to say we are not just forgiven, but we are righteous in the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you have that hope? Do you know today because this Messiah who was promised did come and his work is finished, crying from the cross that we will survey all this week long, crying from the cross, it is finished. Do you know that that work is finished for you? That in acknowledging your need, and realizing that you have needs that God alone can possibly meet and that he's done so for you fully through the gift of Jesus. Do you know yourself to be forgiven? Do you know yourself to be robed in the righteousness of Jesus? Do you know yourself to be sealed with the spirit of God, marked forever, a bride of the glorious bridegroom that's coming back for you? Do you have this assurance? Do you know, do you hear the spirit in your heart today crying out of your sonship? Do you hear not just the lyric of this gospel, but is its music just cascading and, and filling the chambers of your heart with a peace that passes all understanding, with a peace that is not tied to the beginning, middle, or end of a pandemic? I pray you know this peace. I pray you know this Savior, this one Jesus, that has come for you and is coming again. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Hallelujah to salvation. In Jesus' name, we offer this prayer. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your word that you alone are the great promise keeper. And the one who's made promises so big, you alone could keep them. Thank you that in this Palm Sunday celebration, we are reminded of the prophet who spoke very much in a day like ours of fear, of loss, of uncertainty, of being out of control. Father, thank you that you're coming to us now. I pray for Ballykill Presbyterian Church, for the whole community Ballykill. I pray for Northern Ireland that revival would come. I pray for the United States of America. Lord, we are being humbled. We realize we are not in control of this virus. Forgive us, Lord, and help us to return to the only true eternal fortress, which is the gospel, the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We bless you. I Pray you be with this community of believers in Ballykill and help Marty and his leaders. Pray this will be a wonderful week of celebrating the one who has come and is coming again for us. We pray with thanksgiving and great hope in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. Perchance and just willing and hopefully so, we will see you in the fall. God bless you. Happy Easter. Happy Easter.